I'm Haley Draco. Hi, I'm Austin Hunter, and we are counseling students in the master's program at the University of Central Oklahoma. And today we're going to be talking to you about mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for youth. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy was first used on adults with depression in 2003, and then later it expanded to children with anxiety and depression in 2006. So any kids with anxiety or depression and comorbid disorders are able to use mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So before we get started talking about MBCT, we first want to break down the components for you uh, and describe mindfulness and cognitive therapy. So what is mindfulness? An operational definition, unfortunately, has not been decided upon by the greater psychological community because it is such a new concept. Um, however, uh, the definition that we're going to use for our purposes is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So because there has not been an operational definition decided upon to use, it's really hard to compare data on mindfulness-based uh, techniques because one's uh, definition of mindfulness may not relate to someone else's definition of mindfulness. However, there does need to be more research on these types of techniques, but it's very hard and a little bit ambiguous um, to do so because of the definition. So with mindfulness, one's attention is cognitive, co cognitively directed towards something or someone either internally, uh, via thoughts, emotions, or behaviors, or externally, such as sensory perceptions or other outside sources. So earlier we were talking about how anxiety can, or how um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy can be used for anxiety, and you can do the same thing for mindfulness techniques. Um, attention and anxiety correlate depending on certain disorders that you have, whether it be OCD, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety, no matter what type of anxiety, it does impair one's attention. And um, this treatment helps kind of take the person off of automatic pilot and gives them something to focus on and direct their attention towards. And so then um, some of the qualities of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy are intentionality, sorry, intentionality, so being very on purpose and to the point, being present and with your focus, and having non judgmental acceptance. Um, the formal practice of this would be setting yourself aside and taking time out of your day to practice meditation and becoming mindful of your surroundings. And then the informal practice would be everything else that's going on um, in your daily life, and you can assert that to different tasks such as eating or washing the dishes and just being able to do it um, with everything that you do during the day or night or yeah. Now what is cognitive therapy? Um, cognitive therapy uh, uses a blend of techniques uh, many of which are based on operant and classical conditioning and it is based on social learning theory. So social learning theory is based on the assumption that a person's personal disposition characteristics, situational behavior, and environmentally will reciprocally determine one another. Uh, behavior is an evolving and dynamic phenomenon, and context influence behavior, and be behavior influences context. So sometimes contexts have the most powerful influence on behavior, uh, whereas at other times, personal preferences, dispositions, and characteristics will de determine the behavior. So the primary intent of cognitive therapy is uh, to change clients' beliefs uh, in their automatic thoughts and dysfunctional attitudes. Um, there are five interrelated elements involved in human psychological difficulties one of which is interpersonal and environmental context, as we have just discussed. Uh, physio physiology, which has to do with your body's automatic reactions, such as increased heart rate. Um, 
emotional functioning, so how one is feeling, behavior and cognition, so how they act and uh, what they were thinking, why they did what they did. So a study was done by Siegel, Williams, and Teasdale, 2002, suggesting that the effectiveness of cognitive therapy may be changing uh, the changing of the client's relationships to their feelings and thoughts as opposed to changing the content of the maladaptive thinking. So, in other words, this study is suggesting that uh, that cognitive therapy might be able to be used differently in such a way as uh, what we had previously discussed with, uh, with mindfulness. Now, what is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy? MBCT is based on an integration of CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy, for depression and mindfulness-based stress reduction. So MBCT is an acceptance-based approach that does not focus on changing the content of thoughts, but facilitates altering the awareness of and relationship to thoughts. So basically, Thoughts are observed and accepted rather than changed. Um, MBCT teaches mindful awareness of those negative thoughts, feelings, and behaviors or bodily sensations. Um, it is used as a tool to break those automatic negative thought processes and develop other more healthy So to develop those healthy thought processes um, or processes, um, there are some goals and strategies with uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, especially for youth. And so the first one is to increase the awareness of um, increase the awareness and to identify thoughts and feelings and bodily sensations, like Austin was saying earlier. Um, and then the next one is to help the children develop the capacity to um, be in the moment and um, to do so without falling um, into judging and labeling their thoughts and just being in the moment and accepting that they're there. Um, so basically, uh, we'll talk about this later, but judging and describing are definitely not the same thing. Um, and so to become more aware in the present moment um, and not spend so much time being absorbed in thinking and thinking about the past and the future is another strategy and goal of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Because when you're stuck in the past and thinking about everything that happened, it tends to lead to um, associated feelings of regret or remorse, um, guilt or shame, um, anxiety, worries, and fears. So with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, I'm going to talk to you some about, about some of the components that are involved with this sort of therapy. The first one is decentering, which is one's ability to see thoughts just as thoughts um, rather than evidence of reality. Um, so NBCT proposes that thoughts and emotions and body sensations should be observed rather than judged, and um, events should be described rather than changed. Um, so in other words, when I mean judged and describing, what, as I talked about earlier, um, when you describe, you just want to note what it's talking about instead of judging or labeling an experience as good or bad. So this therapy is veering away from labeling those events as bad and just accepting them as they were. Um, and so judgment of, ex um, judgment of experiences are the root and it's actually deemed unnecessary through some of the data that has been collected so just by accepting the experience and accepting the thought or event that happened um, rather than labeling it as a bad or good situation so through this there are a few sensory focused exercises that are taught during um, MBCT and um, some of them are mindful breathing mindful eating um, mindful walking mindful hearing and listening. Um, some of them you can even do a body scan, um, which is a broad overview of 
understanding your surroundings and focusing on your breathing. And then you can even do simple yoga poses um, where it allows you to focus on your breath and focus on um, your surroundings and your movements as well. Um, also with MBCT, it is extremely vital that you do homework and it helps with um, generalizing it to everydayness. So if you're not practicing the exercises and it's going to be really hard for someone to put this into effect. Um, so the homework is really important to keep that generalization and to apply it to more than just one um, action or one allotted time to take out or that you take out of your day. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how NBCT differs between adults versus children. So the first and one of the main things um, when you're going through this therapy is to not think of children as little adults um, because they are not um, of the same capabilities as adults, um, especially developmentally, which is why NBCT has a lot of differences, especially with um, tailoring it to those developmental abilities that kids have. So um, with that, one of the first ones is attentional capacity. So kids definitely don't have the same um, attention as adults do. So um, they have shorter session times and they're more frequent to help the kid be more um, attentive during the session. The second one is multisensory learning, which um, helps kids because they have a less or they have less abstract reasoning and verbal fluency. So with multisensory learning, it's easier to do um, play games with them or um, tell stories or different types of activities to help them understand um, some of those sensory exercises that we talked about earlier, like mindful listening and hearing. Um, so you can do that by having them draw pictures and being aware of what they're drawing, um, have them um, create music um, or listen to music. Um, or touching various objects or eating various objects all to get them to be more mindful in a more fun and playful environment. And then the last one is um, it's tailored towards having family involvement um, because kids are definitely not independent as adults are, so they definitely need their parents there and their family as a support system. And so the more that the more family involvement there is, the better the treatment will outcome will be. Um, so it's highly um, recommended that parents at least um, visit the first session so they can become educated while their child becomes educated. And then at the end, there is a session for um, parents to have a review of what they've learned and how their kid um, worked through it as well as them. So based off of the developmental capabilities, there are three main differences that the uh, treatments actually cover specifically. So uh, for children, the, they, because they have the less of the attention span, uh, they, uh, they do shorter sessions uh, for more time. So 90 minute sessions every week for 12 weeks is typical for children, whereas adults, uh, they do two hour weekly sessions for eight weeks. So essentially that is just used to counter the, uh, the limited attention uh, and shorter blocks of time uh, for the meditation practices, which we'll be discussing a little later. Um, there, uh, there's an integration of ex experiential learning exercises for children, uh, and it's used to counter that limited verbal fluency, abstract reasoning, and conceptualization. Um, parents must, must, must stay active in this treatment. So parents are just almost as much involved in this treatment as their children because children are obviously a part of uh, a larger family system and they typically need that guidance from their parents to be able to practice and remember how to maintain uh, their mindfulness-based cognitive therapy techniques. Okay, um, so with MBCT being for youth, we talked a lot about parent involvement, and so now I'm going to talk about MBCT and parenting um, and being mindful as a parent. Um, so 
it has been definitely emphasized that parents need to be involved with this therapy um, for it to work effectively and get like the best outcome. Um, and then when parents are involved, like we said earlier, it will enhance the treatment outcomes. Um, so mindful parenting um, is not about the conflict-free uh, parent-child relationship, but it's more about the moment-to-moment -moment awareness of the children's overt uh, behavior and subjective experience. And so to become more mindful while you're parenting, there are um, three foundations to do so. Um, the first one is sovereignty, which is the parent's ability to recognize and respect the child's dignity and, and true self. So not trying to change the child, but just being mindful and accepting that that is who they are and um, being faithful to that. Um, the next one is empathy. Um, parents attempt to see the world um, from their child's perspective when they're empathizing. Um, it's super easy to do it when a child is hurt um, and they're crying and they kick into the nurturing mode, um, but it's not so easy to do it when a child is expressing different, like different, uh, different opinions um, than, than the parent thinks. So it's really hard to emphasize with, emphasize with them. Um, and then the last one is acceptance. And acceptance will occur when sovereignty and empathy have happened. Um, so it's done by accepting that the child's true self um, is present and then empathizing with their perspective and their opinion. And that will, in turn, show that the parent is accepting that person or their child, in this case, their opinions and their thoughts and their outtake on certain things. Um, Okay, so now we're going to go into the treatment manuals that are used for mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for youth. Um, so in the first session, um, it's kind of going to be a broad overview of psychoeducation about mindfulness and the orientation of mindfulness and kind of developing the community um, because this is a group session and developing and building rapport between the kids and the parents that are in there and developing rapport with the therapist as well. Um, in this first session, they're going to emphasize a lot about completing the homework and doing it um, because that's very vital, as it was said earlier, to the um, appropriate outcome or the um, best outcome of this treatment. Um, so also during this session, they do some very broad exercises that will allow someone to kind of understand what we mean by being mindful. And so one of the exercises that was talked about was um, having the child um, be mindful when they wake up in the morning um, to smile. And so by doing that, they had um, the kids draw like on a piece of paper um, a picture of a smiley face and they got to individualize it and do whatever they wanted. And then they were told to put it either on the wall or the ceiling to where they could see it when they wake up and it can be kind of a cue for them to smile. Um, and then once, um, it was founded that once that kids, uh, once kids were um, directed to smile, then their, the rest of their day went a lot better. Um, as opposed to waking up and feeling grumpy and carrying that throughout their day, they woke up, saw their picture, and smiled, and then found that it was a lot easier to get through other tasks during the day um, especially when children don't really want to get up or brush their teeth, they found it a lot easier to do so with this exercise. So session two is a much more narrowed down session. Uh, we begin in session two with dealing with barriers of practice. So uh, discussion among the parents about what some of the obstacles may be, things like that. And uh, then we introduce a mindfulness of the breath practice as uh, that is the very beginning sets, uh, that sets the stage for later uh, for further mindfulness exercises. Breathing and uh, yoga poses actually have the majority to do with, uh, with the uh, treatment. Uh, so here in a moment, you will see a clip of Haley and I demonstrating 
the mindfulness of breath exercise and a mindful eating exercise. So uh, we will get into a little more detail in just a moment with that on uh, session three. So for session three, um, their target is to practice differentiating um, thoughts, feelings, and body sensations. So being able to target what their thought is versus what their feeling is versus what they're actually feeling through their body. Um, and then with that, they introduce um, mindful body movements, which were the simple yoga poses and exercises that Austin was talking about previously. Um, and so getting them to um, be aware of their body and how they're feeling and what they're thinking is really the grasp of session three. Okay, so now we are going to um, show you guys what mindful breathing would be like. Um, in this treatment program, since we're doing it with kids, there's a little bit of a difference um, in how you would do it with adults. And so at first you want them to be sitting comfortably in a chair, um, and then you want to explain to them that the difference is between breathing through your nose and breathing through your diaphragm. Um, since they're kids, they tend to breathe through their belly first, and so they call it belly breathing, and it's easier to grasp with them, but um, when they do this, uh, the therapist makes it apparent that when they start breathing, either through their stomach or through, through their nose, um, they should continue doing it the whole time. So they should never like switch up going from like the belly or to the nose. So they gotta pick one. And then also, um, it's advised that the kids can either close their eyes while they're doing this, or they can have something called soft eyes, where they're like looking down in a way um, at something on the ground um, that's not super distracting when they're doing this exercise. And so now Austin's actually going to do it with us. So I'm going to take the role as therapist and Haley is going to take the role as client. So uh, this is the mindful breathing technique and this is how it would go. Are you ready Haley? Mm -hmm. All right. I invite you to bring your attention to the breath. You can focus on the breath watching how the air feels cool coming in and maybe slightly warmer as it leaves your body or you can focus on the breath at your belly feeling it rise and fall as air enters and leaves your body stay focused as best you can on your breath just watch the air as it enters and as it leaves entering your mind wanders, that's okay. Simply bring your attention back to the in-breath and the out-breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Your mind will naturally wander off and get lost in thought. That's okay. It's just what minds do. Your job is to gently bring your attention back to the breath every time you Tell yourself, great job for noticing, and then continue to watch your breath. Notice, Haley was very focused on what she was doing. She was very in the moment. Her eyes were towards the ground distracting and uh, yeah that's essentially the mindful breathing practice um, that will be again the basis of uh, mindfulness based cogn uh, cognitive therapy as well as again yoga poses so uh, that mindful breathing is a lot more important than uh, people would automatically assume uh, but it really does help one relax uh, clear their mind and uh, start preparing to focus on the other techniques during the uh, therapy process. Okay, now we're going to do um, an exercise called mindful eating. Um, it's definitely different than um, what some mindful eating terms could be deemed as, whereas where people are just being more mindful of how healthy they're eating, this one is going to go into the experience of actually chewing a food and swallowing it and becoming very attentive to their body sensations and their thoughts and feelings while they're eating an object. Um, so 
with that, the session says that um, you can do this with a raisin, but today we're going to do it with a strawberry with Austin. Um, so you can do it with really any type of food, um, a food that you like, a food that you don't like, just whichever, whichever one is accessible to you. So I'm going to be doing the therapist role, and then Austin is going to be the client, as you can see the lovely strawberry in the corner. So Austin, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay. Hold the strawberry in your hand. Look at it very carefully, as if you must describe it to a Martian who has never seen one before. As best you can, be aware of thoughts and old images that may sneak in as you look at this object. Just note that they are just thoughts and return your attention to the object. Note the colors of the strawberry. What does the surface look like? Is it bumpy or smooth? Does the strawberry feel dry or moist? Explore the strawberry with your eyes and fingers. Is it soft or hard? Do they have patterns or ridges? Is the texture the same all over the strawberry? How heavy is it? Does this object have any smells? Explore it with your eyes your fingers, and your nose. Is your attention on the strawberry in your hand? Then, whenever you're ready, take a bite, but do not chew. Explore the object. Does it taste or feel um, different than you thought? Is your mouth watering? What do you taste before you chew it? smell? Any sounds? Does the texture change the longer it's in your mouth? As best you can, keep attending to the strawberry and also watch your thoughts. Are the thoughts looking forward to eating the strawberry and eating another? Or are, they, um, or are you focused on the sensations of the one that's in your mouth? Gently chew the strawberry. Taste the flavor. Are the textures on the inside different from the outside? Slowly chew the strawberry while noting every sensation. Swallow the strawberry. Swallow it all the way down to your tummy. Bring your attention to the sensations in your mouth. Are there different tastes or flavors in your mouth now? Are you still noticing your thoughts and sensations as you eat the strawberry? Can you feel that your body is now exactly one strawberry heavier than it was a few minutes ago? How does it feel to you? It's really good. A lot of things that happen that I normally don't pay attention to. Um, mindful eating is a very interesting process, and especially once it kind of, or once I took a bite of it and it started melting a little bit in my mouth, and I have something that I would never have known before because I actually have not taken a moment to really savor strawberries so it was a very mindful experience I could I could did could really focus on the uh, every aspect of the strawberry by just thinking about it just having my attention placed on it makes it made a world of difference so it was okay. a fascinating experience um, yeah and so that is exactly what a mindful eating exercise would be like it's usually really fun for kids um, and it's super easy and it gets them aware and they get to eat something fun. Um, so sometimes you can make it even candy or something like that. And so that is kind of how it goes. It gives you definitely a different experience um, eating an object than you would if you just like popped it in your mouth and expected it. Um, you got to actually savor it this time. And so that is a pretty good way of getting um, your body aware of how you feel with taste and sounds and textures um, and how you think about it and yeah. So yeah, this is a very, very good uh, overall sensory exercise. It uh, does mostly have to do with tasting, but uh, you, you, you tend to use all of your senses for, uh, for this exercise. So it's a very good start and um, it's a little bit more broad than the rest of the sessions. Okay, so earlier we showed you a chart of um, yoga postures, and now I'm going to show you some videos. So 
you're going to go to youtube.com and then the first one is a four minute yoga for kids video um, and so you'll click on it and it should be the top one and it's the it's called four minute yoga for kids with fight master yoga so this is accredited to fight master and so this video is pretty short um, and it has kids doing the yoga poses uh, to show you kind of like what to do so it would make it more useful um, and so that would be a really good technique to use um, in session three to kind of do mindful body movements and so another video that we thought was really helpful is um, five simple yoga poses for kids by kids and so it's the top one as well and um, excuse the skip or the ad and this one is um, accredited to through our eyes and so this little girl here goes through five simple yoga poses that you can do as well um, within session and you can have the kids talk about it um, it's only about four minutes so it wouldn't take too much lengthy time um, but it's really good on showing you kind of how to do certain poses and then the last one is a uh, yoga for kids and it's by we heart yoga and it's the top one as well and it is kind of a mom and daughter type yoga play uh, yoga video with Jessica James who is leading it um, and again this is by we heart yoga and she goes through um, some yoga with kids too and this is another great video and resource you can have of course there's tons off to the side but um, these are just a few so session four is introduction to more specific senses so they begin with uh, hearing so in session four you learn about mindful hearing and listening to the uh, things that are going on around us uh, during sessions uh, there is a receptive listening exercise to identify thoughts feelings and bodily sensations and an introduction to the uh, to a body scan exercise so uh, essentially being mindful about each of the parts of your body um, yeah so in session oh, I'm sorry I apologize it's okay well right, sorry in session five um, they continue talking about mindful here or talking about mindful hearing um, and instead of doing receptive listening where they um, have exercises where they can listen to music they do expressive um, sounds exercise where they get to make music and then they get to label the different types of music after what they thought was going on and um, their experience when listening and creating the music um, and then also there's an introduction to the three minute breathing space um, which was widely used with the kids and they really liked this exercise because it only took three minutes um, but you could expand it to more um, but they found that usually around 10 minutes is when children start to get a little antsy so keeping it between three and ten minutes would be ideal um, and in this exercise they use the acronym called age where they accept um, the thoughts that are happening but they don't change them they just acknowledge that they're there they gather information on the thoughts and they gather, um, then they start to think about their thoughts and their feelings and their body sensations further and then they expand it outward to where they are in the room, their location, what's going on around them, um, all in like the three minutes. So that is another exercise that will allow um, you to be more mindful with hearing and um, movement and uh yeah. Session six, it, uh, they switch to uh, nuisance mindful seeing. So we learn how to look at things mindfully, um, so observe uh, different objects. Um, so also learning what we normally don't see. So taking a look at things that, you know, we wouldn't normally notice at a glance that it's taking into uh, account uh, extreme description and detail. So it's a very focused exercise um, and also we, uh, the next practice is the differentiation between judging and describing so that's the session where you will sit down and uh, psychoeducate the, the children about what uh, a description of something is as opposed to a judgment uh, finally there is a guided imagery exercise so um, yeah that's session six 
so with mindful hearing and mindful seeing and the guided imagery exercise, along with the mindful breath that we mindful breath that we did earlier, um, we provided a clip of a woman named Annika Harris, where she has a website about mindfulness exercises that we are going to show you how to access to where you can use her scripts um, and video recordings in session if you need them to allow further um, ability of being mindful through hearing and seeing and just to give you those resources so you have some um, idea of what it's supposed to sound like and where you can find it. So what you'll do is you will go to google.com and type in Annika Harris. It should be the top link on the Google search and go to her website and scroll over mindfulness for children and guided meditation. Click on that and it will pull up links to the audio descriptions uh, for mindful hearing and all you need to do is click play. Mindful breathing, mindful seeing, and guided imagery. Okay, so now we're up to session seven, and session seven is a continuance of the mindful seeing exercise that you were doing in session six, um, where you're practicing directing your attention um, to places, and then seeing like optical illusions exercise, um, and mindful movement exercise, so we're starting to get into different parts of your senses, and so we're moving from seeing to moving, um, and by doing that, they did um, exercises where the child can pretend to be a flower opening or a really tall tree or a butterfly and feel our, and uh, be mindful of what they think those would look like when um, with their movements. And uh, so session eight is a switch to mindful touching. So uh, essentially the goal of that is to... Um, Pay attention to the feeling, uh, the physical feeling of certain objects, such as uh, a stone, for example. Uh, a really smooth stone would be um, something to touch and kind of use as um, use as practice. Essentially, you would learn how to stay present with what is right here and now. And uh, there, uh, they also do a body scan exercise. Um, so we have provided a link at the end of this uh, video to uh, show you the body scan exercise if you want access to it there. The clip will play right after, um, and it's just a clip that you can find on YouTube, um, and we will show you how we found um, this exercise and what it's supposed to look like so you can go and look at it as well. Um, the next session is session nine, and we start to talk about mindful smelling, um, which we kind of did with mindful eating um, and mindful tasting. And they continuing, or they start to continue the practice of differentiating between judging and describing because that's very important with this treatment um, and reiterating and reminding them that they need to note what they're doing and not judge it as a bad experience or that I don't like this type of food or I don't like this type of music, but rather, oh, I'm listening to this type of music right now or I'm eating this type of food and uh, veering away from the labeling um, and focusing more on the describing and accepting. Um, and then, of course, they start to talk more about yoga, uh, yoga movements um, and postures that, are, uh, that have been taught and that are still being taught throughout the session. Okay, so now you're going to go to youtube.com and you're going to type in body scan for kids in this uh, top bar. And then you'll click the three minute body scan meditation mindfulness for kids video and that is what it'll look like at the very beginning. And this video um, walks kids through a three minute body scan um, by Fable 5. And you can have your um, kids sit and watch this, and it'll take three minutes, and it'll prompt them through um, thoughts and feelings and body sensations 
and give them an overall grasp of So, their session body. 10, we uh, switch over to mindful tasting. So, essentially, what that is, is it's similar to the demonstration we did earlier that was more involved with uh, all around senses, but mindful tasting is going to be the focus. Um, then they do it, uh, we do an exercise called Thoughts Are Not Facts. So, uh, that essentially, that is a tackling of uh, understanding that thoughts are just thoughts. It doesn't mean that uh, we have to act upon those thoughts or feel anything about those thoughts, but instead, we can just think of them as thoughts in our head. Um, and then, uh, mindful body movements is the secondary exercise in session 10. And it uh, essentially is uh, practicing more yoga postures that are suited um, for mindful tasting. <laughs> so uh, the mindful body movements is uh, the final exercise in session 10 and tends to take up a good portion of time. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so now in session 11, we're generalizing it to mindfulness in everyday life. Um, and this is when we talk about um, the kids' everyday lives and how they can apply these mindfulness techniques to them. And then we also start to have a review of previous sessions um, and then uh, have like an integration of acceptance of experiences through mindfulness. So they start to talk about all the different um, exercises that they did in the previous sessions um, and then evaluating those experiences and learning the acceptance factor of the experiences through being mindful. So session 12 is our final session, and this session essentially is focused on generalizing mindfulness to everyday life. So it is essentially uh, thinking about exploring and sharing uh, thoughts about uh, how to transition mindfulness into more things than just the five senses that we've talked about or that we've learned about throughout this uh, throughout the therapy sessions. And so. Um, the generalization tends to be the difficult part into, into life, so it is also important to uh, begin closing out the program by exploring and sharing personal experiences for uh, each person, uh, each child, and potentially the parents, depending on how much they attended, which uh, typically would be each session. And uh, so uh, it's an important time to where we gather, uh, where each of the members gathers each other's information to be able to help each other out in the transition to uh, real life and uh, there is a very brief graduation ceremony at the very end just to uh, celebrate the fact that each parent and child made it uh, through the 12 session progress and hopefully learned a lot uh, and hopefully will be able to improve their uh, their symptoms of anxiety and depression in children. So, Also there is a um going to be a little clip of this treatment that um, you can use for adolescents. So the one that we just described to you was for kids range like 9 to 12 and then so now there's another one that is adolescent age so from 12 to about 18 or so um, and they talk about the same ex uh, same exercises and um, the same psychoeducation and stuff like that it's just tailored more towards adolescents where their attentional capacity is definitely more developed, but not as developed as an adult. So it tailors towards um, the population of adolescents, and they can also be with people who are um, of the same population in their peer setting, so that way there's not a, like a um, wide age difference between people in uh, different sessions when doing this program. Okay, so with MBCT for children, um, there can be some obstacles in doing this treatment. And so the first one um, is remembering. Um, we all know that children definitely have a hard time remembering things, and even adults do too. So a solution to this would be uh, to have the child create like a stimulus cue or a piece of paper where they can put it in a location where it reminds them to do their exercises and they can make it very individualistic and help them jog their memory so they can do the activities. The next one is patience. Um, we all know that doing this is not going to happen overnight. So um, 
we like to think of it as gardening. So when you garden, you have to plant the seeds, and then you have to nurture the seeds, and you have to water it, and um, give it time to grow, and then eventually you'll have a really beautiful garden, but that doesn't happen overnight. Um, the next thing is incentives. So because you're working with kids, it's always good to give little small cost-effective incentives to have um, to increase participation with the treatment. And then last thing is practice, practice, practice. So um, if you don't practice, then you can uh, definitely won't be able to understand the exercises on their own. Okay, so now we are concluding our topic about our talking about uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy in youth. Um, this treatment is definitely very promising. Um, however, there definitely still needs to be more research done to um, have it widely used among um, the psychological world. There's definitely some controversy with people thinking that the operational definition is a really big factor and having it um, so ambiguous that it's really hard to replicate data and understand. And then also the word mindful has definitely taken um, a different toll in a lot of different and a lot of people definitely see it in a different light than another person does. So um, it gets thrown around a lot, and some people may not understand what being mindful really is, or they may see it as a different definition than someone else, which makes it hard to have a concrete um, definition and a concrete and concrete data supporting mindfulness-based therapies, um, especially with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So. Thank you for watching our video today. We are certainly glad that you did. Um, hopefully you will be able to utilize it to your benefit and help out uh, some children that are in need of mindfulness. Uh, so we appreciate it and have a good day.